Francis, the road to 76, a labour of love in many ways, I'm sure it's finished. Firstly, take us back to the beginning. Where did the idea for this book come from? Well, I'd written, uh, I'd written a few novels while I was a practising teacher. Nothing fancy, just uh, under the pseudonym Guy Langdon, books on Amazon. And uh, a good footballing friend of mine, Andy Blair, who was a school outfitter uh, for the school I worked at, said, you know, what are you going to write next? And I said, I don't know, Andy. He said, well, why don't you write a football book? And I thought, OK. And then he said, well, I can get you some contacts. What would you write on? And uh, the thought process then was instant. I just went, QPR 76, because that was my growing up, standing out there on the loft. Um, and uh, a whole season which is indelibly fixed, you know, in my head. So it would work from there. He got me a few initial contacts. I got a few myself, I've got to say. Uh, managed to finesse Facebook and one or two other places. Uh, you were very helpful as well, Paul. You gave me Phil Parks. And every player you get, gets you one more. So uh, I got about 19 players in the end. But what was really important for me was not just getting the QPR legends who were going to say, yeah, we were great, we were great but also getting uh, opponents. And they had some great stories to tell. Um, I think my average uh, telephone conversation was about half an hour. And I managed to track down Malcolm McDonald and he was still going after two hours. You know, just had some great stories to tell, particularly about Stan, because the rivalry, as you know, between Stan and Malcolm McDonald uh, at the time was quite vociferous and quite fierce. But he had only great things to say about Stan and one or two funny stories as well, which are in the book, obviously. Um, the other thing, really, was finding players who almost signed for QPR. Um, so Steve Perryman, uh, lifelong QPR fan, really, even though he spent all, those, all that time at Spurs, and Tony Curry. Um, I know he signed for Rangers, but you know, we had him on our books when he was about 14 and let him go. Um, so that was fun as well. So I wanted to get it from... Uh, other players' perspectives and not just QPR. Um, interestingly, I caught Phil Thompson just after he got out of the shower. Uh, that was a number that, was, that, that, that Andy Blair got for me. And he was telling me, he was about to go to Anfield, but he was telling me how Liverpool invented total football. And I thought, hmm, OK. I just wrote it down. I thought, I'm not having that. But it's, it's in the book as well. But obviously, Liverpool were a great side. And the rivalry between the two teams in that season, I think, comes through in the book. It must have been like living out a childhood dream. Like you say, that, that time, that season is imprinted on your mind and you are now speaking to the people that made it happen or the people that stopped making it happen how we wanted it to end in the Liverpool players. But what was the, the one that really excited you that you spoke to? Um, my favourite was probably Dave Thomas. All right, I, I won't attempt the, uh, the northern accent. All right, lad, how's your... I phoned him up and uh, his wife Brenda answered the phone and he was out in the garden tending his tomatoes. And he came in and he gave me the best half hour, uh, full of praise for Rangers. Never wanted to leave, I might add, you know, when he did leave. And he actually phoned me up the next day as well to give me extra information, which was fantastic. And when I sent him a copy of the book, um, he was straight back on the phone, thanks very much. Oh, by the way, Frank McClintock wants a copy. And uh, so I phoned Frank, and Frank says, oh, you need to give Dave Webb a copy. So in the end, I, I've spoken to everybody, really, you know, who, who's survived to this day, which is fantastic. But Dave was great. All right, lad, he called me son. I like anybody who calls me son, even, especially my dad. But Dave was just a lovely guy, a lovely guy. And, of course, Stan Bowl was not in a position to be able to, to talk and contribute to the book. But how did you speak about Stan? Who did you speak to in detail about Stan? I didn't really have to mention Stan. Everybody I spoke to talked about Stan. I mean, Don Masson's a good example. He said that he couldn't believe how great Stan was. Jerry obviously spoke about what it was like to play with Stan. The fact that the first training session, you know, they just hit it off. And he kept reiterating how he would love to have played with Stan for England. Um, I mean, supporting England in the 70s was a bit of a torturous affair. But those two never played together for, for their country um, for various reasons. But maybe things would have been different. Maybe we'd have got to uh, the 78 World Cup or the 74 World Cup if they'd have both been playing. The book is full of fascinating anecdotes without giving away too much. Give us an example of one. 
my my favourite is probably um, the story of uh, Stan and Don Shanks um, being up there somewhere, uh, higher up in the South Africa Road stand, trying to get a bit of dosh out of uh, Ron Phillips, um, as they as they used to. And they're stood either end of the corridor. They know Ron Phillips is in his office because they can hear the music. He always had the radio on, Ron. And um, so they staked it out. Now, Ron Phillips' secretary knew that Stan and Don were there. So she phoned him through. And uh, Ron Phillips basically opened the window, uh, skirted down a drain pipe and ran to White City Tube. Um, and I think Stan and, and Don were probably there for another hour waiting for, for Ron to come out of his office. That's, you, that's, a Ron, so that's come from Ron, so it's a great story. Did you get the feeling from speaking to the, the players that were involved in, in that era, the QPR players, of the bond that existed between them as a group? Absolutely. Um, every player in that team had a different role in the dressing room. Frank McClintock was, was greatly admired. Uh, and of course, before Frank arrived, Venables, Terry Venables was a leader. Um, some of them were quite gregarious or outgoing characters, and some of them were quiet. But that, because everybody was different, it, it, it fitted in nicely. I mean, Dave Webb was a character, um, famously always last out on the pitch. Um, you know, others were called Mick Leach, quiet lad, but everybody's got praise for his professionalism and dedication to the game. And everybody I spoke to said Mick Leach was underrated. You know, it was a real engine room of that team. Um, and, you know, at the time I thought he was great and couldn't understand why the fans were on his back. So, yeah, I think you need that. Um, you need people to be different. You know, Don Masson told me that when he first came down, nobody had heard of him, really. Notts County player. And um, in the first training session, um, not only was he impressed with the standard of uh, the other QPR players, <clears throat> but they were impressed with him, with his QPRs. And he's very proud of the fact that when they used to play Piggy in the middle, <clears throat> he was never in the middle. He told me that. So I think the QPR players have, have wondered what, what Dave Seckland had done buying this, this guy, you know, from a lower league. And he was, um, you know, the, the missing piece of the jigsaw, really. I think especially after Terry Venables had gone, I think when Terry Venables went, Stan and Jerry and one or two others were a little bit disappointed. Uh, but Don Masson, you know, he wasn't a replica of Terry Venables. He was a different player in many ways, but so important in the base of that midfield. Which player that you spoke to took you by surprise? Um, that's a good question. I think Don Masson, in a way, because he was so humble and so generous in his praise of the other players. And I think at the time, I mean, he was nicknamed the Führer when he played, you know, and he was, he was very much, uh, you know, I'm in charge, I'm going to take this free kick, you know, knocking Hollins out of the way so he can take it. Um, and I expected him to perhaps be a bit gruff, you know, and a bit hot, but he was a lovely guy. Very, very humble, and uh, I had a great chat with him. I think the most difficult one was the first one, um, because talking to your childhood heroes, <laughs> you know, Imagine somebody from the 1930s who's on the phone to Charlie Chaplin, you know, it, it, it was like that. And, and Ian was my first and I was pacing up and down the garden thinking, oh, I've got 20 minutes to phone Ian, 10 minutes to phone Ian. Ian Gillard. Ian Gillard, yeah. And he totally put, my, put me at my ease and told a great story actually about Leighton James, who came here, I think, playing for Burnley. And he was playing on, on Burnley's left. So Dave Clement was, was looking after him, shall we say. And Dave Clement, I think, you know, kicked him into the stand once or twice. And so Leighton James came over to the other side and thought, I'll try my luck against Ian. Well, anyway, suffice to say, within five minutes, he was back on Dave Clement's side. So, uh, you know, the, the two of them uh, worked well together, I think. Ian said they were called, you know, the deadly duo. They, they got on well and, and obviously both capped for England as QPR players, which is a golden era. As a group, did you get a feeling of how they look back on that period? Is it one of pride or is it tinged with regret? I think both. I mean, more the pride came through. Obviously, I had to broach the subject of the run-in and, um, you know, the defeat at Norwich. Um, but pride, I think, that uh, a relatively 
I won't say a small club, it's not small in my heart, it's massive, but a club of QPR stature could really, you know, have combat with the big boys. And um, not just for that season, we've done it since, you know, we've done it under Venables, we've done it under Jerry Francis, we've had good teams, but that was the great team. So there is a bit of sadness. Um, obviously, there's a chapter devoted to the, uh, the Wolves-Liverpool game um, right at the end of the season. And that was my opportunity to get feedback from the fans. Uh, you know, it's all very well having great interviews with the players, 19 interviews I had with the players, but to get that game and the run-in from a fan's perspective. Um, I was stood in the loft when we played Arsenal in the penultimate game of the season. And uh, when we got this penalty in like with, with two minutes to go, and Jerry stood up, stood up and, and thumped it in, that was the, the highlight, I think, of my teenage years. Because it just kept the journey going, you know, to the very last game. The very last game, Liverpool against Wolves. It, so many things are hard to comprehend right now, not least the fact that there was a couple of weeks passed between QPR's final game of the season and Liverpool's final match. Also, it wasn't televised. The only people who were able to watch it are the QPR players who went along to the television studios to sit together and watch it. That's right. Did you find it fascinating finding out how players found out whether they were champions of England or not? It's interesting. Um, Don Masson was on Scotland duty, I think, and was, was, was up north. Um, Ian Gillard was down the pub. And, and didn't want anything to do with it until the result came through. Um, and of course, Jerry and Stan were, were in the BBC studios. I think they both left before the end. Um, I think Stan had had a bit of money on us winning the league, which he put on, to be fair, before the league even started. So he was going to earn a few grand, which, of course, was, would have been important to him at the time. Um, so, yes, I mean, Jerry, I know, was gutted. Absolutely gutted. And of course, unfortunately, the next season for him wasn't great. He was racked with injuries and um, eventually obviously had to give away the captaincy of his country. But he came back as manager uh, and a great manager as well. I think he's one of my favourite QPR managers. Now, an incredible gesture as part of the book as well is that the money raised from it going to some very worthwhile causes. Tell us about those. Yes, well, it was never going to be a money-making, you know, I didn't intend it to be a money-making project. I wasn't looking, um, I knew it wasn't going to be an international bestseller anyway, you know. Um, but uh, it was very important to me that um, the family, the QPR family could benefit from this. And, and the genesis of deciding where the money was going to go it didn't happen overnight. But in the end, I thought, we'll give some money to Alzheimer's. Obviously, that's in recognition of Stan's contribution to the club. Guide dogs. Uh, for the blind, because Dave Thomas is my favourite interviewee apart from anything else. And also I want to buy some toys for Hammersmith Hospital. Um, in recognition of the fact that back in the day, the players used to go um, every Christmas and dress up in centre outfits uh, for the kids there. There's a rather cheesy photo of the Rangers players dressed in centre outfits in December 75. None of them seem to be able to wear it properly. <laughs> They've all got bits of beard missing. But they used to do that. Um, and enjoy it, and I think that's, that's you know, important. important. How can supporters buy the book? Um, you can log on to the road to 76.bigcartel.com uh, and get it from there. I'm a one-man band, so there's nobody else receiving any money from this. Uh, I've just got to pay my costs and obviously donate the rest to charity. It's only a tenner. Um, over 300 pages, Paul. <laughs> Over 60 photos, and uh, the 19 interviews are, are woven into the tapestry of the book. I've got to say, I was really fortunate. Um, Dave Thomas, the other Dave Thomas, the kick up the arse Dave Thomas, I asked him for help, and of course he is all things QPR, memorabilia, and he, he's got contacts. And he put me in touch with a man called Paul Willer. Now, Paul Willer uh, was an amateur photographer, and he was given a pass to sit down there um, just by the goalpost uh, in front of the loft every Saturday, from the late 60s, I think, through to the 70s. And any photos that he thought were worthy, he would, he would send to QPR on the Monday, and Rangers just used to pay for any photos they used. 
Often they wouldn't use any because John Bruff was the photographer at that point. But um, uh, Dave managed to get me Paul Willer's phone number, which is actually his daughter's phone number. Um, and he was, he was 92 years old. And I went to visit him and his daughter Jo in Sirencester. And um, he lent me these negatives, uh, which was just like gold to me. And the great thing about that was, in the book, I was able to put photographs which were perhaps unusual, some of which had never been seen, rather than the iconic photos that everybody knows. Everybody knows that photo of Stan jumping in front of Malcolm McDonald when he scored that late winner uh, at St. James's Park. I could have put the iconic photos in, but I thought I want to put more unusual photos in, photos that people haven't seen. So there's some great photos of the, uh, it, from 67, the game after we won the League Cup, um, photos of us be, you know, being received by the fans um, at the Bournemouth game, which we won 4 0, and some great you know, mug shots of the players uh, as the 70s unwound. But most importantly of all, I think, a photograph of Stan lying on the ground having got that penalty against Arsenal in the penultimate game. And a photograph, that's the cover photo actually, of Jerry on his knees, having scored that penalty, echoing you know, the relief that was all over the ground, particularly in the loft. Have you enjoyed it? It's been a fantastic journey. Um, I'm so pleased, really, that the, the important part of it is not writing about what I think, but, but just getting it firsthand from the players. And also digging out of the loft the scrapbooks that I've kept uh, from that period. So that, that was good fun as well. So mixing together the newspaper reports, the interviews, and obviously the, the thoughts of the fans who were there at the time. I was uh, 15 years old. I thought it was always going to be like that. <laughs> you know, European champions the year after next and so on. But it's not like that, but if you're a QPR fan, you take the rough with the smooth. And let's hope for some smooth shortly.